Hello and thanks for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and tuition is voluntary at patreon.com slash Academy. There will be links in the description. For some reason it seems to be human nature to enjoy seeing someone striving to surpass us fail. I don't know why we are that way. We are fascinated by the failures of movie stars and presidents, as if they were not just as human and error prone as the rest of us. This is not a nice emotion, and like jealousy, damages only the person holding on to it. I enjoyed watching the Starship 9 test flight. I wish it would have landed. I did not enjoy the media making headlines about a test failure. The flight was not a failure. It's a lesson. We need to fail down here so we don't fail up there, was famously said by Neil Armstrong, right after he crashed a $2.5 million lunar lander test vehicle. $2.5 million in 1960s money. I love discussing these issues and had suggested in our chat that all three engines should ignite higher up and then shut down one because only two are needed to land. That way if one fails to light, you're still okay. The chance of two failing to light is much smaller. I'm happy to say that in a conversation with the everyday astronaut, the man himself agreed. Watching the Starship 9 test flight got me wondering, how fast is terminal velocity for something that size and mass? And how will terminal velocity on Earth compare to Mars? SpaceX plans to land the Starship on Mars using arrow braking to slow its descent. In this lesson, we will run some numbers on serial number 9, so we understand terminal velocity on Earth. We will review atmospheric composition, pressure, and density. Over the next few lessons, we will study planetary atmospheres, so we understand the differences between Earth, Mars, Venus, and Titan. And then we'll run the math for Starship reentry on these worlds, starting with Mars. We will quickly see why the naysayers claim Starship will never work. Then we will show why they are wrong. There are a few concepts that have always given me problems. I have often confused atmospheric pressure with density. To understand the difference, let's look at some basic principles. Let's start with Avogadro's principle. Because gas molecules are so tiny and bounce off of each other at such a high velocity, we can disregard their actual size and mass when we are calculating pressure. In any particular volume, there will be the same number of particles of any type of gas for the same temperature and pressure. This means that if you have one liter of oxygen and one liter of helium at room temperature and the same pressure, there will be the same number of particles. I'm going to stress this several different ways because it is so important. For any set volume, under the same temperature and pressure, there are a set number of gas particles that can fit into that volume. So equal volume containers of pure carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and oxygen at the same temperature all have the same number of gas particles. Rule number one. The number of gas particles in a specific volume at the same temperature and pressure is constant. This also means that when you have a gas like air, which is a mixture of nitrogen, oxygen, argon, and carbon dioxide, a cubic meter of air at any given pressure and temperature will have that same finite number of molecules. A mixture of gases does not have more particles per unit volume than a pure gas. If there is more oxygen, then there are less of the other gases. The Earth's atmosphere is about 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% argon. The actual numbers are here, and trace gases like carbon dioxide make up a very small percentage. That means that for every volume of air, let's say a cubic meter, at a specific temperature and pressure, let's say 288 Kelvin or 15 Celsius, and one bar of pressure 100,000 Pascals, there will be a certain number of molecules, and of those molecules, 78% will be nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% argon. Now Avogadro's number is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. That is the number of atoms in a mole. And it turns out that at standard pressure and temperature, there are 22.4 liters of volume for every mole of gas. We could flip that by taking the reciprocal and say that for every liter of gas at standard pressure and temperature, there are 0.045 moles of that gas. There are 1,000 liters in a cubic meter, so we could say 45 moles of gas per cubic meter. Now each gas particle has a mass. Nitrogen gas is a molecule made up of two nitrogen atoms. Each atom has an atomic mass of 14 grams per mole, giving nitrogen gas a molecular mass of 28 grams per mole. 
One mole of nitrogen gas at standard conditions will have a volume of 22.4 liters and a mass of 28 grams. That means one liter of nitrogen gas would have a mass of 1.25 grams. One cubic meter is 1,000 liters. One cubic meter of nitrogen gas would have a mass of 1,250 grams or 1.25 kilograms. Since this is kilograms per cubic meter, we could also say the density of nitrogen gas is 1.25 kilograms per cubic meter. If we do the same math for oxygen, we get 32 grams per mole divided by 22.4 liters equals 1.43 grams per liter or 1.43 kilograms per cubic meter. Argon is a monoatomic noble gas with an atomic mass of 40. We do the math and we get 1.79 kilograms per cubic meter. Now we look at the percentages and multiply by the fractional equivalent. And we get that there should be 1.293 kilograms of air per cubic meter at atmosphere at standard pressure 101,325 pascals and temperature 15 Celsius or 285.15. But we are given that the actual number is 1.225. What did we forget? We have to check their reference standards. A mole of gas is defined as 22.4 liters at a temperature of 0 Celsius or 273.15 K. Our sea level density was calculated at 15 Celsius. If we use the gas equation, PV over T equals PV over T, and assume that pressure is constant, we get a volume at 15 centigrade, or 288.15 Kelvin, of 23.63 liters per mole. If we plug that into our equations, we come out to 1.225 kilograms per cubic meter for dry air. In real life, air is rarely dry. Going from a percentage of 0.2% at minus 40 Celsius, up to a high of 4.24% at 30 Celsius. Water vapor is usually around 0 to 4% of Earth's atmosphere. Water has a molecular mass of only 18. So moist air is less dense than dry air, even though it doesn't feel that way. At sea level and 30 Celsius, if the air was 4.24% water vapor, the density would go down to 1.209 kilograms per cubic meter. Now we understand atmospheric density. Let's look at pressure. The gravity on a planet is holding the atmosphere to the surface. Some light gases like hydrogen and helium are stripped away into space, but most stay put. At the surface of a planet, all the weight of that planet's atmosphere is pressing down. This creates our atmospheric pressure. If we consider that the atmosphere ends at the von Karman line, 100,000 meters, which it actually doesn't, but it is so tenuous past that point that it might as well, we would have 100,000 cubic meters of air pushing down on every square meter of surface and air density decreases rapidly at higher altitudes. We saw last lecture that we can't just look at 1.225 kilograms per cubic meter and multiply by 100,000 cubic meters. At just 10,000 meters, the density has dropped to just 0.4127 kilograms per cubic meter. At 20,000 meters, it is 0.088, and by 30,000 meters or 100,000 feet, it is just 0.018. When I take the average density every 5,000 meters and add them up, I get 10,458 kilograms. If I multiply that by Earth's gravity, 9.81 meters per second squared, I get 102,591 pascals, very close to the 101,325 at sea level. The difference is that density drops not in a linear fashion, but exponentially in a curve, as you see here. Also remember that as you go away from the Earth's center of mass, gravity gets slightly weaker. This would have to be factored in also. If I were to use calculus, we could clear up the discrepancy. The weight of the air pressing down creates the pressure we feel at the surface. Now we understand atmospheric density and pressure on Earth. Let's look back at Starship Serial Number 9 and see what we can figure out. The dry mass of a current Starship is given as 120 tons. The ship has no payload on these test flights, and we will need two engines running at about 72% throttle to safely land. One engine won't be enough. A sea level Raptor puts out 2,200 kilonewtons or 2,200,000 newtons of force. The specific impulse at sea level is 330 seconds. Force equals m dot times c star, or characteristic propellant velocity. If you don't know what I'm talking about, please go back and review this lesson. That means that propellant mass flow equals force over c star. c star can be calculated by multiplying the specific impulse by Earth's gravity. 330 seconds times 9.81 meters per second squared gives us 3,237 meters per second. If the maximum thrust of each Raptor is 2,200 kilonewtons, and we have two of them, 4,400 kilonewtons operating at an average of 72%, we will have a total thrust average of 3,168 kilonewtons with a maximum of 4,400 kilonewtons. This should be enough to counter over 30 g's of force. If we divide that by C star, we get 979 kilograms per second, so almost one ton. 
If we assume a burn time at full thrust of 15 seconds, we get 14.7 tons. Let's call it 15 tons, coming back in free fall with the Starship so it can land. So the dry mass of a Starship is given as 120 tons and we added 15 tons of propellant for a total of 135 tons. Now let's drop it. It fell from 10,000 meters where the air density is 0.4135 kilograms per cubic meter. But as I watch the video, it doesn't start falling until an altitude of about 9,000 meters. So the air is a little denser there, about 0.4671 kilograms per cubic meter, according to the tables I found. Remember we need air density, not pressure. If we average the density between this altitude and sea level, which is again 1.225 kilograms per cubic meter, we get 0.846 kilograms per cubic meter. We estimated the landing propellant mass before the burn starts at 15 tons, so the total mass of our ship will be 135 tons, losing about 1 ton per second as it blasts the two engines at 72% power. We have the mass and air density, and to complete our calculation we will need the surface area and drag coefficient. I pulled up this awesome picture here and did some math, several times in fact, and got a surface area of 520 square meters including the wings if they were fully extended. The wings won't be fully extended though. If the wings are at 45 degrees, they should present half of their surface area to the airflow. If we factor that in, we get 456 square meters of surface area presented to the airflow. Now we need a drag coefficient. If we look at the last few seconds before the engines fire, we see the ship at 274 kilometers per hour, or 76 meters per second. If we assume that this was terminal velocity and put this into our velocity calculator and solve for drag coefficient, we get 1.19. If we look up the drag coefficient for a cylinder falling broadside, we find that several sources agree that it is about 1.18 to 1.21. So that seems reasonable. The medium air density was 0.846 and gravity on Earth is 9.81 meters per second squared. Now as soon as the engine starts firing, the velocity will drop rapidly. Someone asked about the Starship just coming down vertical, more like a booster. The booster actually puts quite a bit of its broadside to the airflow. But let's just change the surface area to straight up and down. Remember the surface area would be just that of a circle and the drag coefficient would change. A cylinder falling vertically does not produce as much drag as one falling horizontally. Let's cut ours about in half, from 1.19 to 0.6. The area of a 9 meter diameter circle is 63.6 .6 square meters. Adding a little for the flap edges and let's use 64 square meters. That's uncomfortable. The terminal velocity changes to 285 meters per second or 1026 kilometers per hour. A very big difference from what we had broadside. Remember that while momentum is mass times velocity, Kinetic energy is one half mass times the velocity squared. If we do the math, the force required to stop our starship falling vertically is over 14 times the force required to stop it than when it is falling horizontally. Let's make sure we fall horizontally. In the next lessons, we will evaluate re-entry heating, heat shielding, and coming back from low Earth orbit, lunar orbit, and Mars. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Help us on Patreon if you can. The link is in the description and stay safe at Astro Proterra.